Our current sermon series is Bible postcards. Those are the one-page books of the Bible, and we're looking at working our way through all of them. We began with Obadiah in the Old Testament. We've spent two weeks on the book of Philemon. Notice I said single page. I didn't say single sermon. And our next one is the book of Second John. The other ones are Third John and Jude. And we're going to do a deep dive into Jude that I'm sure you've never heard before. Uh, to find Second John in your Bible, you might want to start at the end and start working your way forward. The New Testament ends with First John, Second John, Third John, Jude, and Revelation. Like the other postcards of the Bible, Second John suffers from neglect. In over a half century that I've been a Christian, uh, I'm not sure that I've ever heard a sermon on this book that I didn't preach, except for a cross-reference uh, here and there. Now, as with Philemon, when you see the background, this book is going to be pretty easy for you to understand. Second John is not complicated, but it is profound. Most of the debate around the book of Second John, and the same things apply to Third John, arises in verse 1. The book begins, John, uh, sorry, the elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth. The big questions are, who is the elder, and who are the chosen lady and her children? Well, the difficulty arises primarily because the author of this letter, same as 3 John, doesn't give any other hints about his identity except the elder. So whoever the elder was, he knew that the recipients of his writings would know exactly who he was when he used the term the elder. It was a nickname. So it was well known to his friends. Now, there have been a lot of silly ideas that have been propagated through the centuries, but there's one that fits the facts. The elder is John the Apostle. He's the brother of James. James and, John's are, uh, James and John are the two sons of a man named Zebedee. They were called sons of thunder. Uh, he is the author of the Gospel of John, the sequel to the Gospel of John, which is 1 John, this book, Third John and Revelation. So he, he wrote five books of the New Testament, second only to the Apostle Paul. And there's very strong evidence to support that, both from comparing the book to other writings that we know to be from John and from quotations and allusions to this book from the early church as early as the second century. So we do know that John was the last of the apostles to die, and the evidence is quite strong that he, he didn't write his books of the Bible until around the time 85 to 95 or 96 AD. Uh, the fact that a book as small as this was so rapidly circulated and quoted uh, tells us that there is strong attestation to the fact that everybody who was in the know knew this is an apostolic book from John himself. There's no re reason to reject the long-standing tradition that this was written by John the Apostle late in his life. I don't know how much you can make of it, but he probably wrote John and then 1 John and then 2 John and then 3 John and then Revelation, but it makes no difference. You can get to heaven no matter what order you think they were written in. Next, we need to understand who is the chosen lady and her children. Now, depending on your translation, it might say the elect lady and her children because the word chosen, the word elect, same Greek word, um, eklego, chosen by God. Now, remember something that you've heard many times around here if you're a veteran of Heritage Bible Church. When you are reading something in the Bible, if the natural sense makes sense, there's no sense searching for any other sense. 
when something is plain, take it as plain. If it's symbolic, there will be tip-offs that it is symbolic. The commentaries on 2 John are just rife with classic examples of violating that principle. What's the most natural sense? The Apostle John wrote this letter to a specific woman and to her children. I think it's safe to assume probably grown children and therefore an extended family that was well known in that region. We also, I I think, can fairly surmise she was probably a widow because there's a lack of reference to a husband, which would have been typically the way that uh, a household would have been addressed. He did not use this woman's name, but then he didn't use his own name either. If her name was crucial, it would be a funny name, but if it was crucial that we know her name, um, we would know it because it would be here. This lady and her family were, we can tell from the letter, given to hospitality. They were well known for ministering to fellow believers. And John wrote to caution them about the possibility of being ripped off by deceivers. This letter was considered so practical and important that it was quickly uh, passed around and shared with all the other believers. And in the providence of God, it was intended all along to become part of the Bible. That just makes sense. I would even be so bold as to say it's obvious, but you would be surprised how complicated people try to make it. Many say that the chosen lady is the church and her children are the members of the church. Now, why do they say that? Because they made it up absolutely out of thin air without one shred of evidence. The closest you can come to anything that you might call evidence is that the Greek word ekklesia, translated church, is grammatically feminine in form. And that means nothing. It doesn't, the church is never called a lady anywhere else. A lady is called a, a lady. So that doesn't mean anything. As a matter of fact, uh, as you work through this book, most of the time there are singular pronouns used. Like in verse 4 and verse 13, a singular lady. That would be a very strange way to refer, to refer to a group of people like a congregation. When Paul wrote to churches, he addressed them with uh, plural uh, pronouns. So John was old. We know that he had many friends in the region in which he lived. There's very strong evidence that he lived in and around the region of Ephesus and uh, that, that area known as um, uh, the Roman province of Asia. We would call it Asia Minor. It's mostly in the country of Turkey now. There was that cluster of cities with churches all founded during Paul's missionary journeys. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, uh, Philadelphia, Laodicea. There was also Colossae and, Her and Heropolis. The book of Colossians was written to Colossae and the book of Philemon went to a man in that church. That's where John lived for those years that he survived about 20 or more years beyond most of the rest of the apostles. Then he wrote these five books of the Bible uh, late in his life. Now, there's an obvious theme word here. There are actually two or three theme words here, but I would say the one that rises to the, to the top is the word truth. And it's introduced in the first few verses there. We already read verse 1. We'll come back to it. But we can use the word truth as the basis for outlining the 13 verses of this book. Truth is the source of life. Truth is the rule of life. Truth is the boundary of love. Truth is the boundary of fellowship. And then truth, well, there's too much to say. So let's look at the beginning I'll read the first three verses. Truth is the source of life. The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, for the sake of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Well, there's that theme word, truth. 
Uh, in his epistles, John often contrasts truth and lies, truth and falsehood, um, black and white, light and dark, Christ and antichrist. He, he, he's very skilled at writing in antitheses. And he talks about here the truth as opposed to uh, deception. And notice that um, he says to be in the truth is to be a Christian. It's the same as to be in Christ. Notice how he equates truth with Jesus Christ. He says, the truth abides in us. Well, it's certainly true of Christ. Christ abides in us. We abide in Him. And then he says, truth will be with us forever. Well, Jesus said, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And Hebrews 13 says, I will never leave you, or I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. So, John's going to say to this dear lady and her family, there are many deceivers over out there. They make lies sound good. And you need to know that the source of eternal life is the truth, which is embodied in Jesus Christ. So look again at verse 3. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Well, there's a standard greeting, or a standard greeting, grace, mercy, and peace. But John worded it a little bit differently than you find it in most other New Testament books. He says that it will be with us. He didn't say, may it be with you. I'm praying that it be with you. He's not saying this is a, this is a prayer or a wish. It's a promise. He'd lived 85 to 90 or so years as he wrote this. He spent three of those years in the presence of Jesus himself, the truth, and 60 of those years as his apostle. John understood the practical reality of the promises of God. He's saying whatever you encounter, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and his son Jesus will be with you. Absolute ironclad promise. You belong to Christ. He's with you. Now, he was careful to include a very precise and complete description of Jesus because of the circumstances that he was writing about. Notice he calls him Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. Since this letter was written to caution friends against being involved with deceivers who don't preach the true Christ, he was very careful to specify details about the incarnation of and the deity of Jesus. A lot of people don't realize that the, the first main theological error that came down the pike after Jesus ascended, concerning the doctrine of Christ anyway, did not attack His deity. You would think somebody would say, oh, what, you mean a man was God? Actually, it was the other way around. They said, no, Jesus was a man. The Christ Spirit came upon him at his baptism. Remember, something like a dove descended on him. And then he became Jesus the Christ. And then that Christ Spirit left him before he was crucified. It, it's known today as Gnosticism. There's a, a very bad Christological part of, uh, of, of Gnosticism. So, very significant to say Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. He always was the Son of the Father. He became a man. And notice also here the juxtaposition of truth and love. That's an introduction to what, how the rest of the letter sounds. Truth and love are inseparable because they, they complement each other. So if the primary theme word of 2 John is truth, the second theme word is love. In just the 13 verses of this little postcard, truth appears four times and love appears four times. You're going to see another word that occurs four times. And now I just lost seven of you who are going to try to be reading through it to figure out what that word... Oh, don't worry, I'll get there. Understand, uh, love is not love if it denies or ignores truth. You cannot justify skirting the truth because you say you're doing a loving thing. God's truth is never to be delivered without His love. It goes both hand in hand. Paul says twice in Ephesians to speak 
truth in love, each one of you with your neighbor, because we are members of one another. In 1 Corinthians, he wrote that if we lack love, we are like a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Truth can be used like a battering ram, or it can be used like a miracle medicine when it's wrapped in love. It has to be mixed properly. Truth is the source of life. Secondly, truth is the rule of life. And I'm not saying that there are grammatical turns at these points in my outline. I'm saying here's how they relate to the theme word of truth. Truth is the rule of life. Verse 4, I was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. Uh, walking in truth is the key phrase here. A Christian is one who confesses the truth of God's Word and lives in harmony with what he or she claims to believe. He's not, <coughs> he's not talking about perfect obedience. We know that none of us is capable of that, but he's talking about the lifestyle of a person who judges all things by the standard of God's Word. Always we need to ask, what does truth require me to do? That's the right question, not what can I get away with? What does truth require me to do? Now, he said he was, he was very glad about these people walking in the truth. That, that those three words, was very glad, translates one Greek word that's used in such a way to indicate that John had been personally involved with these people that he was commending. I've, I've seen the impact of some of your ministry. Maybe, maybe biological children, maybe grandchildren, but people you've influenced. And that makes me very glad. I know... I'm no apostle, but I know as a person who is devoted to teaching people the truth of Scripture, there is no joy as wonderful as seeing people devoted to the truth of Scripture. There's no joy like watching somebody live according to God's Word. The greatest joy of ministry truly is seeing people walking in the truth and enjoying Christian fellowship with like-minded believers. And the greatest heartache of ministry is people turning from the truth or people abandoning fellowship or destroying fellowship. So John's really specific about making sure his words are not subject to misinterpretation or twisting. He says, just as we have received commandment to do from the Father. In other words, when he talks about truth, he's talking about specific truth, the things revealed in the Word of God. The voice of God is recorded in the Word of God. Your personal opinion of what is true might be interesting, but it doesn't matter about the way to get to heaven. What God says is true is what matters. We have a lot of thinkers in our society today who are pretty successfully convincing a generation or two to reduce truth to something relative, something subjective, something you know, personal. But that simply isn't true. I listened this week to a little bit of a a recording of, of somebody witnessing on a college campus and talking to people who, who honestly, truly believed, I can have my truth, you can have your truth, they can be mutually exclusive and contradictory, and they're both true. Because it's, it, it's what works for you, it's what works for me. So, so okay, so if my truth says that I should, uh, sh should pull out a machete and lop off your head, that's okay? Well, no. Well, why not? Well, that's wrong. Well, why is it wrong? Well, I believe it's wrong. Well, why do you believe it's wrong? I just do. That's my belief. It, it, it becomes, it re truly does become laughable, but it's tragic. We have now the high and humbling calling of taking the truth to a generation that rejects the idea of truth. There are people today that truly do not believe that there's any such thing as absolute truths. And yet, to say there are no absolutes is an absolute. You know, you, 
that shows the issue is blindness, spiritual blindness. They need the, they need the blinders lifted, which is the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to open their eyes to the truth. The truth of God's Word is the standard by which everyone will be judged. So truth is the source of life, and truth is the rule of life. And then verse 5, truth is the boundary of love. He writes in verse 5, Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we've had from the beginning, that we love one another. Notice he uses commandment in this context as a synonym for truth. He uses truth four times, in the first four verses, he uses love four times in this book, and here's the other one. He uses commandment four times in the rest of this letter. When he says, I'm talking about the commandment that we've had from the beginning, he's going way back to that first thing he wrote, the Gospel of John, where he recorded the words of Jesus in John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this all men will know you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So how do I love God and love my neighbor? Read on, verse 6. And this is love, that we walk according to His commandments. Not we walk according to what makes us feel good, not we walk according to our own personal truth, not we walk according to what doesn't hurt anybody else, we walk according to His commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. The command to love God and the command to love your neighbor are not two separate things. Every command of God is a requirement to show love to Him and to our neighbors. And he uses that same word we've seen Paul use so much, walk, the word for describing your, your daily conduct. You can say all you want about being a Christian and believing the truth, but if the truth doesn't affect and control the decisions that you make every day, and if it doesn't direct you toward loving others, well, then your claim to belong to the Lord is, is, is in question. You can be a staunch defender of the truth of God's Word and not show any love to others. You can believe that God's Word is inerrant and that Jesus is His Son, but if your relationships with others don't manifest love, then what you say you believe is, well, it's, it's suspect. If you really know the truth... It sets you free. That includes setting you free from bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander and malice. This freedom shows up in your life in the pattern of loving other people in the same way that you love yourself. And just as you want people to treat you, treat them in the same way, the so-called golden rule, Luke 6.31 and Matthew 7.12. Truth is the source of life. Truth is the rule of life. Truth is the boundary of love. And number four, truth is the boundary of fellowship. We're sneaking up here on the punchline. Notice the first word in verse 7, for. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver and the antichrist. Notice how carefully that's worded. There's a big difference between saying Jesus, the man, became the Christ and Jesus Christ came from the Father. Difference between right and wrong, truth and fiction. This is why Paul, or not Paul, John, wrote this book. It's the reason for the commands here. Many deceivers have gone out into the world. Hey, look, the apostles weren't even dead yet. John was still around. It had only been 20 or 30 years, 20 years since the close of the ministry of the Apostle Paul, and already many deceivers have gone out into the world. That's the same message that he gave in 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. He calls these false prophets deceivers because they deal in deception. Their spiritual or spiritual destruction 
of Christians is one of their goals. The other one is preventing people from becoming Christians. And he gives us this description, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. There's nothing more crucial for you to understand if you're going to be able to avoid deception when it comes to who Jesus is. He is fully God. That's His deity. He is fully man. That is His humanity. He is totally both of those all the time simultaneously. He does not have an invisible switch that he can flick. I'm going to do something in my humanity now, and then a little later today, I'm going to flick over to the deity side. I think I'll heal a few people. No, he is Jesus Christ, the God-man. Neither one of those aspects of his being overshadow or negate the other. He existed for all eternity. He took on human flesh by being born of the Virgin Mary. He always was the Messiah. The word Christ is the Greek word for the Hebrew word Mashiach, Messiah. He died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again on the third day. He ascended to the Father, and He will return again to set up His kingdom on earth. That's the, about as short as you can make the description of who Jesus is. And there are many deceivers out there. You might encounter them today. There's a whole group that says that Jesus is actually the archangel Michael. There are people who say that he is a son of God. You know, he achieved a really high status, but he's not God the Son. Very big difference. There are those who say he was born of a man and he became the Messiah at his baptism when that Christ spirit descended upon him. That was a, the, the teaching of Gnosticism that has been adopted by a lot of new age kinds of people. You can have that Christ spirit come upon you as well. There's a group that says he was a spirit child of the God named Elohim and one of his many wives. There are those that say he was a great teacher and a great example who therefore came to be called Son of God. There are people who say he was a man who achieved godhood by virtue of his works. There's a, there's a wrinkle of that these days among most of the prosperity gospel preachers and uh, some others in the charismatic movement that say that we are little gods Kind of find the little God in you and sort of water it and fertilize it so it'll grow up and take over. And you can do the same things that God did. You can speak things into existence. Not true. People say there's a similar spirit in you that can be discovered and developed. I mean, we're all sons of God, right? Or there are those that say he was a great man who taught and did wonderful things. And then his followers, who liked what he said, embellished the truth into myths and legends that we have in the Bible so that no one really knows the historical Jesus. You ever see those two words together, historical Jesus? Just slam the book or turn off the TV, go away. It's people who are presuming that what we have in Scripture, which documents who Jesus is better than any other person in antiquity, we know that isn't true, but here's what we think people made up, and here's what the historical Jesus might look. Look at no one who believes or teaches any of those things about Jesus Christ is a Christian. It doesn't matter what they say. They may have the word Christ on their church buildings. They may have the word Christian all over them. But if you don't hold to the biblical doctrine of Jesus Christ, you cannot be a Christian because you're saved by the God-man Jesus Christ, the only mediator between God and man, the one and only Savior. And you're saved only by grace, only by faith, only in Christ, only on the authority of Scripture. There's one way. There's only one way. And Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by me. So, those who say otherwise are deceivers and antichrist. Now, what does he mean? It, well, a deceiver is one who tells you uh, something that isn't true. Now, most deceivers 
are themselves deceived. They're the victims of their own deception, but they're spreading lies. Antichrist, we use that as a capital A, Antichrist, to describe the man who's going to be the, the, the world leader in the end times, but it literally means instead of Christ or opposed to Christ, and in a context like this, it refers to anyone who substitutes anything for the true doctrine of Jesus Christ. Now, here is the punchline of the letter. Why did he write this? Verse 8, watch yourselves that you might not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Now, there's, there's a little bit of enigmatic stuff there, but understand, he's not saying you can achieve salvation and then lose it and achieve it and lose it, or you might achieve it and then lose it once for all. That's not what he's saying. He's talking about the concept of rewards. You read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, most extensively, and we've taught on that in the, in the past. The idea is that your works as a Christian, not in order to become a Christian, your works after you become a Christian will be tried by fire. Those which prove to be spiritually gold, silver, and precious stones, they will remain and they will be rewarded. What is wood, hay, and straw will be burned away by the fire so that only the good things are left and everyone is rewarded for that. But it says here that you may receive a full reward. That implies the possibility that maybe there's a level of reward that you might have achieved, but you might miss out if you get deceived along the way. And this passage tells you that you can miss out on reward you might have earned by being deceived or by par participating in the work of a deceiver. Fascinating subject. It has nothing to do with the doctrine of salvation. It has everything to do with the doctrine of Christ and other things that are in play. Now look at verse 9. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching, those are parallel, one, it's one description in two parts, goes too far and does not abide. Anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he has both the Father and the Son. When someone believes anything else other than what the Bible teaches concerning Jesus Christ, it's not a child of God. That person's not a Christian. That person's not saved. He must not be treated as if he is a member of God's family, because he isn't. So when you venture beyond the boundaries of revealed doctrine concerning Jesus, you've crossed a line. And that's the line we must hold to. It's very clear. Verses 10 and 11. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting for the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Now that doesn't mean be nasty to them. Okay? That does not mean verbally assault them. What it means is don't welcome them into your home or welcome them into your church or Pretend that what you're doing in your interaction with them is Christian fellowship. Now, there's giving a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. That's a good thing to do. What about those people that are ministering so tirelessly to the, to, to the refugees from the, from the war in Ukraine? That's a good thing. It doesn't, you don't say, I, I, I see you're starving, and I know your kids have eaten, haven't eaten for three days. What's your doctrine of Jesus? Tell me, and maybe you can get a Big Mac. No, that, that, that's not what this is saying. But do not receive them into your house. That was a much bigger deal in the early church. Cults love to prey on those who know just enough about the truth to be extra gullible when somebody comes along and seems to know it well. Well, I, these people were talking to me and, and uh, you know, their, their, their name tag said elder and they know the Bible better than I do, well, that means you have a problem. Okay? You need to know the Bible better than they do. You, 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 they're going to come. And in the early church, 
Hospitality toward strangers was a lifeline for traveling Christians. Motel 6 was not leaving the light on. There were no KOAs with hookups for your donkey or camel on the edge of town. You had to rely on your spiritual family. Now, it's quite possible that John was also referring to a a house church, a group of believers worshiping together in, in a house. And if that's the case, he's emphasizing all the stronger, the church must not welcome so-called teachers and prophets without testing their doctrine. Anyone is welcome to come and visit us anytime. Bring your friends. We'd love them to hear what the Bible says. We'd love to have opportunity to, 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 to share the gospel with people. But we don't just have somebody who comes and stands at our driveway and passes out pamphlets say, oh, come get in the pulpit. We want to hear what you have to say. It doesn't work that way. The line to draw is never let a false teacher into your home or permit him to teach you his doctrine. If you can't take, take control of a situation to make sure you share the gospel, it's better to just excuse yourself and close the door than to open up your household and your family to deception. Fellowship has a boundary. The truth. You can't have Christian fellowship with people who reject the truth about Jesus Christ. And if you assist them along the way toward teaching their error, you are participating in their evil. And that's not a good thing. Oh, and, and by the way, this command does not negate the other commands to welcome strangers. Hebrews 13, 2, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Oh, that's quite a verse. We know it happened at least once in Sodom, but it says some have entertained angels without knowing it. So sometimes you being kind to the one who is the stranger, the one who is hungry, the one who does need a cup of cold water, the one who does need temporary shelter along their way, oh, that can be a really good thing. But Christian fellowship is something very different and very special and very precious. And the boundary on fellowship is truth. Finally, truth. There's too much to say. Look at verses 12 and 13. Having many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that your joy may be made full. The children of your chosen sister greet you. Now this little letter makes one strong point. Truth is everything to a Christian. It's the source of life, the rule of life, the boundary of love, the boundary of your fellowship. But Notice this final important principle here. There is no substitute for face-to-face -face discipleship and fellowship. The idea that you don't need to spend plenty of time learning from more mature believers, that's bunk. You need to be with each other. We need to, uh, iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. It's good to be together. It's good to talk about things. It's good to, to weigh ideas and then say, now let's bring them to the scriptures and see what is absolutely right here. Look, recordings are good things. This is being recorded. It will be used elsewhere. Uh, the internet can be used for a couple of good things and a whole bunch of bad things. Um, radio, television can be used for good things. We've been on radio for years and years. It's the most used portal into the fellowship of Heritage Bible Church. Books are, are, are a great treasure, but there's nothing in any of those that can possibly replace fellowship face-to-face -face in the body of Christ. You can't grow the way God wants you to grow in isolation. Oh, and by the way, verse 13, 
the children of your chosen sister greet you. I won't bore you with the inane spiritualizing you can find in commentators. You know what that means? John sent greetings from nieces and nephews and cousins to the chosen lady and her family. If you can't leave it at that, I don't know, read another book of the Bible. If the natural sense makes sense, there's no sense seeking any other sense. This book is so clear and simple. Helping deceivers is like committing spiritual treason. So keep the balance always anchored to the truth, always tenaciously clinging to love. And if your knowledge of the truth is not causing you to reach out beyond yourself to serve somebody else, well, then you're not walking in the truth. Pick up a packet of love, walk with the truth into the world, and spend as much time and energy on serving as you do on studying and praying and reading, because we are the stewards of truth and love. And let's pray. Father, thank you, for, uh, thank you for the truth. Thank you for the written truth of your word. Thank you that you loved us so that you sent your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him would never perish but have eternal life. Oh, put that message on our hearts. Help us to see the people around us, not as enemies, but as victims of our enemy, as, as prisoners of our enemy, and help us to speak truth and love that they might be set free. Have your way with each of us. To that end, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.